It's 1870, and Victorian England is gripped by devastating newspaper headlines. The finest, newest ship in the Royal Navy has gone down with nearly all hands in a storm that modern battleships should easily be able to survive. Testimony from the lucky few who made it tell a terrible story. The ship has rolled over and sunk in just three minutes. But this was not a disaster nobody could see coming. Quite the opposite. In fact, for years now, two men had been in a heated disagreement over it. The vessel's designer, a celebrated war hero, versus the Navy's chief architect, the brain behind some of the most revolutionary designs in the Victorian arsenal. This is a twisting tale of bluster, incompetence, and design mismanagement that would result in one of the Royal Navy's bloodiest days. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the tragic, unbelievable true story of HMS Captain, the battleship that was doomed by design. Our story begins in 1860, where, in the British Admiralty, some interesting things were happening. Riding at anchor was an absolutely revolutionary ship for the Royal Navy, the first ever iron-hulled warship HMS Warrior. She had been built in response to the build-up of the French Navy in a tit-for-tat game that had lasted decades. Back in the days of Napoleon, warships very much looked and behaved the same way they had done for centuries. They were made of thick timber, typically oak, and fired iron balls, among other types of shot, out of guns and carronades that were rated by the weight of the shot they could hurl. The smallest could be around 9 pounds, 4 kilograms, and the largest up to 36 pounds or 16 kilograms. The guns were limited in range and accuracy, so engagements were often undertaken at close ranges in slogging matches that saw the iron balls fired point blank into the oak hulls, spraying deadly splinters out into the crews inside. It was nasty business, but that was the way it was done for hundreds of years. Then, slowly, some new and novel ideas began to catch on. Inventors and boffins had been playing with steam engines for decades, and some even had the bright idea of applying them to small boats. In fact, at the same time as Napoleon's armies were marching on Russia, some clever people had fitted steam engines to boats designed for towing other ships into port. Now, the idea caught on, and by the 1820s, the tugboat had changed world commerce because big ships could be unloaded quicker and more conveniently. By the way, we did a video on that, and you should go watch it if you're interested. The steam engine had obvious military potential. The Americans built a steam-powered frigate back in 1815, and through the 1820s, the navies of France and Britain began to experiment as well. Now, of course, on land, steam engines were catching on too. Now, the birth of the Industrial Revolution meant that improved manufacturing techniques could be implemented on ships as well. The stage was set for an unprecedented technological boom, and the Industrial Revolution began. Suddenly, ships began to get bigger and more daring in their construction. Steam engines became the norm, and then guns got bigger too, firing shot as heavy as 68 pounds or 30 kilograms. In 1859, the French introduced Gloire, or Glory, the first ocean-going ironclad which had a wooden hull partly protected by iron plating. Now, this was a modern warship designed to fight the same kind of battles as French ships of the line had fought back in the days of Napoleon, toe-to-toe -to -toe at close quarters, broadside to broadside. Now, the British couldn't let the challenge go unanswered, of course, so they built Warrior. Now, it sounds impressive that Warrior was the first iron-hulled warship, sure, but the Navy was actually a little bit late to the party in a way, because Isambard Brunel's famous SS Great Britain, the first true ocean liner, had featured an iron hull some 15 years earlier. The benefits of an iron hull in an ocean liner were very clear. The ship could be built larger and lighter, and it would be better protected from the elements. But for a warship, the benefits were even greater. Glass old-fashioned guns couldn't touch it. The balls would just rattle harmlessly off the side. In fact, the Warrior was impervious to any gun then in service. What followed Warrior's introduction was the inevitable game of tit-for-tat, as competing navies introduced ships that began to move further away from the broadside-style battleship of the line that Gloire had so resembled. In burst a key player for the Royal Navy in this battle of supremacy, Sir Edward J. Reed, chief constructor of the Navy from 1863 and a real innovator and visionary. Reed knew that the battle between guns and armour would require a new and fresh approach, and although his ideas might now seem to be common sense, you have to remember that in this age there was absolutely no precedent, and the engineers simply had to make things up as they went. 
Galois' designers had built a ship that would have dominated the Battle of Trafalgar of 1805, but was rendered obsolete within a year of launch by Warrior. Warrior's armour had been impervious to any projectile back in 1860, but within a few years, gun technology had caught up. Reed needed to design Britain's ships for a completely new kind of warfare. His first idea was the centre battery ship. Now, this was partly inspired by the Battle of Hampton Roads between the Union ironclad, USS Monitor, and the Confederate, CSS Virginia. Reed's idea was that the guns and powder could be housed in a central casemate structure, heavily armoured and protected. Now, doing this meant that the rest of the ship could be less armoured, and the ship itself could be smaller, and therefore, theoretically, more manoeuvrable. Critically, a shorter ship meant that it would be cheaper to build and maintain, which, for a peacetime navy, was a big deal. HMS Bellerophon was the first central battery ironclad after tests had been done on smaller designs and converted sloops, and she marked a major departure for the design of battleships. Now, for one thing, the ship's guns were immense compared to the old style cannons, they were breech loaded. They fired a 9 inch, 229mm shell. The ship's waist was protected by an armoured belt, and her gun turrets were housed in casemates 6 inches or 152mm thick. Now, this presented the formula by which warships were armoured for nearly the next 100 years, and the modern battleship was born. There was, however, still a persistent issue. The guns were fixed in place, just as they had been on the older style broadside warships. To truly be effective, the modern warship would need to be able to engage the enemy on any course without moving the entire ship. This is where we have to introduce our second important character. A clever idea had come from a certain Captain Cowper Phipps Coles. This name will be very important later on, by the way. While he was a gunnery officer of some renown in the Black Sea in 1859, he patented the design for a revolving turret. The idea had partly come from the Crimean War, when he and a team of officers and men constructed a floating raft that mounted a 32-pounder gun and shelled Russian positions on the land. It sparked an obsession with the idea of ships as floating batteries, with protected gun shields sitting low in the water, like his raft had, to present as small a target as possible. His design for the revolving gun turret, then known as a cupola, received important support and the Admiralty was listening. They agreed to build a prototype and mount it to a ship for testing. The results were impressive. The gun, a 40 pound breech loader, could fire faster and more accurately without the need for complex and delicate tackle. Aside from the fact the gun could fire in nearly all directions, the rate of fire was significantly increased, and so too was the crew comfort because there was less smoke and heat, although the noise was apparently nearly deafening. Cole's Coppola gun needed only 9 men to operate, versus the 11 men required for a similar broadside gun. And not only that, but the Coppola, when fired upon by a 100 pound gun for testing, received 35 hits without any real damage at all, save for one cracked plate. Now one key advantage was that the further the target got, the more difficult the shot became. Where broadside gun's accuracy would drop off, the Coppola gun just got better. The Admiralty was impressed, and two older ships were converted into turret ships mounting Cole's designs. So the road to the design of HMS Captain had winded and twisted its way through innovation and clever design concepts in a world that had never before seen this kind of technology in action. Reed's designs had changed the warship forever into what we know today as the battleship, but Cole's turrets improved naval gunnery in the extreme. Both men were confident in their abilities, more emboldened in their designs, and Cole's mind drifted back to his Crimean War raft and the dream he'd had of a ship presenting as little a target as possible while mounting massive turret guns. He wanted to have it built, and he would get his way. He lobbied the Admiralty to build a turret ship to his design and specification, and they instructed him to take one of Reed's designs instead, the HMS Pallas of 1865, and size it up. The result was HMS Monarch. Designing these ships was not easy at all. For one, there were problems caused simply by the nature of their construction. Iron-hulled steamships were, by that stage, too fuel-hungry to be able to cross the world's oceans on steam power alone. That's why ships of that age held onto their sails and masts as a kind of auxiliary power. The issue was that turrets on ships added a fair amount of weight themselves, and, mounted too high up on the hull, presented seaworthiness issues. You could have masts and sails, and your ship could go further, but turrets would upset balance and the ship could roll dangerously. Or you could have a reduced sail rig and mount the turret guns, but the ship would be limited to coastal and home defence duties, it couldn't cross the oceans. Now Coles would have none of it. He began to lobby hard for a fully rigged turret ship that could be the vanguard of the fleet, a sea-going 
ocean-crossing turret ship. Now, Reed, who had served as chief naval constructor for some time now, recognised the issues and warned that to do so could cause issues with seaworthiness. The two men began to butt heads, which culminated in a furious debate at the Institute of Naval Architects. But Coles had good popular support. In 1865, a committee was established to explore his ideas and the viability of an ocean-going turret vessel. He had asked the Admiralty for assistance in a new design, and had given him the services of naval architect Joseph Scullard, chief draftsman of the Portsmouth Dockyard. The pair had drawn up designs for an ocean-going ship building a single turret. A group of naval officers, nominated by the Admiralty, although Coles had hilariously offered to nominate his own members in a totally non-biased way, of course, sat down and examined Scullard and Coles' designs to give their opinion. The outcome was that they liked the idea, but they rejected it almost purely because the design was too small and mounted only one turret. They wanted more, in case the one turret jammed, for example, or it was knocked out in action. More importantly, although maybe later on, was the matter of freeboard, that is to say how much of the ship actually rose above the waterline. Reduced freeboard in Cole's previous ships wasn't an issue because they were designed for coastal operations in calm water, but a reduced freeboard in an ocean-going ship could be a recipe for disaster if it wasn't handled well because it would be difficult to keep the ocean from getting into the hatches and the vents. The issue with turret ships is that they needed low freeboard though because of their sheer weight. If the hull was built too tall, then the ship's centre of gravity would be dangerously high. Reed pointed out that there could be ways to avoid this issue and said that nothing but the greatest carelessness could make a ship of that sort unsafe from the wash of the sea over her. He did not object to designing or building an ocean-going turret ship, but he was worried about Cole's authority over the matter and the fact that it seemed like he was putting all the responsibility for the design onto Scullard, who had really only just been brought on to assist. The result of all of this was approval for a test vessel, the first ocean-going turret vessel, HMS Monarch. Crucially, the ship was designed by Reed, who recognised the issue that fielding two turrets high above the waterline might present. To assist in how the ship would behave at sea, she was given a forecastle deck, which would provide more buoyancy towards the bow, but of course this blocked the firing arcs of the forward gun turret, and it irritated Coles, who seemed to prioritise firepower above all else. Reed had also increased the freeboard from Cole's proposed 10 feet to 14 feet. And even though the Admiralty was delighted with their new toy, and turret guns could at last take to the open seas, Reed was himself not thrilled with his creation. He wrote that the middle of the deck of a fully rigged ship is not a very eligible position for fighting large guns. The major issue was that the sheer amount of rigging in the way, all those ropes and stays, would need to be cleared away for action, which was an incredibly time-consuming and complex process. Coles was also unimpressed with Monarch, because the design had departed from his concept. The forecastle he saw as unnecessary, and he took issue with the increased freeboard and the height of the belt armour and the turrets. Coles went on the attack, publicly condemning Reed's efforts with such vehemence that the Admiralty had to step in and censure him. It got so bad that his contract as consultant to the Navy was cancelled. But Coles was a well-respected war hero and a designer. He had powerful allies in politics, and the civilian world who trusted his judgement and saw his as a revolutionary mind. After something of an apology, the Admiralty reinstated his role as consultant, but they were feeling external pressure to adopt his ideas in their purest form in a new design. Coles had lobbied hard for his design to be approved, and even had backing from the first Sea Lord. Not only that, but the public had taken considerable interest because warships were so interconnected with national glory. The greatest strides in design and technology had cultivated a strong sense of public pride and feeling, and Coles, the loudest voice in the room, was lauded as a kind of technological savant. The Admiralty Board eventually caved and agreed that Coles' design could be built, but with one little important caveat. Coles would need to wear the responsibility of the design and oversee it in its entirety, constructed at a yard approved by the Admiralty entirely under Coles' own supervision. The Admiralty and Reed did not trust Cole's ideas, and they were not going to be the ones to wear the embarrassment if the design should fail as they feared it would. Coles agreed, and the stage was set. HMS Captain was born. It would lead to the death of nearly 500 men, including Coles. Coles informed the Admiralty that his shipyard of choice was Laird's at Birkenhead, England, and soon a pair of designs was submitted for Reed to review. 
Reed, who was no great fan of the concept or Coles to begin with, was actually unusually generous in his assessment, reporting that the designs were clearly well thought out, but he flagged the tiny freeboard, just eight feet. And he suggested the drawings required a fuller and more exacting examination before approval could be given. His request was ignored by the First Lord, John Packington, who told Coles that he had approval to build his ship, quote, on the entire responsibility of yourself and Messrs. Laird. For their part, the Admiralty would inspect the workmen and the materials to make sure they were up to standard. Reed was dismayed by this and he made it clear that the designs and plans were entirely Laird's own and that anything sent to him would not be marked approved in the usual way, but as no objection is seen. Even so, as construction began, Reed voiced his concerns in a letter to Laird, stating that, On investigating the matter, I find that the centre of gravity of ships armed and plated in the proposed manner is situated higher than would appear probable at first sight, and I would advise Messrs Laird be requested to satisfy themselves thoroughly on this point. But his objection was virtually all but ignored. As it happened, Laird's had only conducted basic estimates of the centre of gravity of their ship before construction, and then... When the ship was finished four years later, at last completed a more thorough estimate, which showed it had risen by a foot. Even worse, it soon became clear that the ship had been built terribly overweight, with some 735 tonnes of excess weight having not been taken into account at all during the construction process. This would soon have serious ramifications. Of course, towering over all of it were the heavy gun turrets, and above that, the tall masts and the complex rigging for the sails. In fact, Coles decided to fit his ship with the heaviest possible mast and spar plan in an effort to counter any of the sluggish seafaring behaviour from those early steam-powered warships. In most vessels, the mast height might reach about 86 feet to the top, but captains soared to 96. It was a lot of weight above the waterline, and Reed was very unimpressed. He had raised alarms the entire time Captain was being built, but in return he earned criticism and scorn. It became too much. Before Captain was finished, Reed resigned in outrage, and with his departure went all resistance to HMS Captain's design deficiencies. Captain was completed in 1870, and given she was a bit of a prototype novelty, the Admiralty was keen to compare her against contemporaries, especially her forebear, HMS Monarch. Now, right off the bat, it was obvious that not all was well with Captain. For one, she sat far lower in the water than she had been intended. When the ship was first floated, she sat 13 inches or 33 centimetres lower in the water than designed. The result was an overweight, top-heavy ship with a freeboard of just 6 foot 7 inches. Remember, she was meant to have 8 feet above the waterline at least. In a moderate sea, she rolled up to 14 degrees, but this was considered acceptable, with her captain, Victoria Cross winner Hugh Burgoyne, going so far as to say that Captain was a, quote, complete success, and in my opinion, one of the most efficient men of war in the world. The big question was whether Captain's guns would be impacted by all the rigging surrounding the turrets, and a gunnery trial was organised where Monarch and Captain, alongside a third warship, the central battery ship Hercules, designed by Reed at the same time as Captain, would fire under steam on a target. The results were bad. Very, very bad. Hercules outgunned Monarch and Captain, both in terms of accuracy and rate of fire. Reed's ship fired 17 rounds and hit the target 10 times. Captain only managed 11 shots and 4 hits. That wasn't all. Captain began to exhibit some bizarre, worrying behaviour. With her guns blazing, the ship began to roll. The first salvo sent Captain over by no less than 20 degrees. Now, Reed had warned in a debate at the Institute of Naval Architects that a ship capable of rolling to 20 degrees like that was in danger of losing its writing ability entirely and liable to capsize. He would soon be proven tragically correct. If it wasn't such an awful loss of human life, you could probably classify the events to be one of the most devastating cases of I told you so in naval history. On September 6th, 1870, Captain was cruising in a squadron of 10 other warships, a combined force of vessels from both the Channel and the Mediterranean squadrons out of Vigo, Spain. They were both steaming and sailing off the west coast of Spain at Cape Finisterre, a rocky peninsula often at the mercy of the Atlantic Ocean's legendary temper. Sailing in the squadron were Monarch, Warrior, Hercules, and other big names from the early days of British ironclad battleships. In command of the entire exercise was Admiral Alexander Mill aboard his flagship, the Lord Warden, and that morning he stepped aboard Captain to inspect her since she was something of a novelty and he was totally unfamiliar with her. 
With the two formations of ships in column, Milne inspected almost every inch of the warship, no doubt led by her captain, Burgoyne, and her designer, Coles, who was actually aboard for the exercises. But then, a blow came on, and the sea began to increase. Milne and his flag officers struck out in their boat for the Lord Warden, but Burgoyne tried to get them to stay, worried that the conditions would be too much for the little boat. But happily, the Admiral and his men made it back to their ship, and it would prove to save their lives. With the wind freshening and a breeze coming in hard, the squadron forged ahead. Milne observed clearly that the sea was washing over Captain's deck, and that she heeled alarmingly from side to side. The squadron had their sails set, but slowly they began to reduce canvas as the wind's strength rose up to a force-seven blow. The barometer began to fall, the rain fell and the sea rose angrily. By 1am, it was a full gale, and all square sails had been taken in, the ships relying on their engines and staysails to keep their bows pointed into the waves. Milne gave the signal for open order so the ships could disperse and reduce the risk of collision in the dark, and the two columns spread apart. The Admiral watched HMS Captain battle the seas with the wind on her port bow, the ship listing hard over to starboard, but as the darkness spread and the night wore on, he could eventually just see her dim bow light in the distance. Then, sometime in the night, it blinked out, obscured, he thought, by rain and sea. With a dangerous cross sea, and with only very limited sail, the Lord Warden battled onward through the night, and by the morning the gale had abated. The squadron had scattered, and soon enough, ten ships were accounted for, but one was missing. Thinking that the captain had proceeded to the rendezvous point, the squadron made steam and sail, but there was no sign of her. A search effort went underway, with the big warships gliding to and fro over miles of empty sea. Then, there came ominous sightings. First, HMS Monarch found a top gallant yard, a very important spar from a ship's sailing rig. Then Admiral Milne's Lord Warden found another yard, still with the sails attached, and then finally, later that day, a kind of debris field was discovered. Battered and smashed cutter boats floating upside down, more discarded yards and booms, and then the body of a sailor, with his name, Rose, stitched into his shirt. Sodden and battered floated a Union Jack flag, which was quickly fished out of the ocean. Everybody knew immediately that the captain had been lost. Burgoyne, the celebrated Victoria Cross recipient, was gone. So too was the ship's designer and greatest advocate, Cowper Phipps Coles. Nearly 500 men were unaccounted for, and in fact, Milne's first report said that the ship had gone down with all hands, and what might have happened to her would probably remain a mystery. Except, fortunately, he was incorrect. A boatload of 18 men was found, and they had miraculously survived the battering of the heavy seas in their small, wooden, open-top boat, and the story they told was frightening and damning. Around midnight, they said, Captain Burgoyne ordered all mainsails furled, but it was too little too late. Captain was rolling to and fro, and the press of so much wind on even a small part of her spread of canvas was extremely dangerous. In fact, a survivor said she was only under her topsails and her staysails. Captain lurched hard onto her side. Burgoyne called out, How many degrees does she heal now? The answer was chilling. Eighteen, somebody called. She lay on her starboard side, with water crashing over the bulwark, washing men away as they tried to hold on for dear life. Others were holding on high up overhead in the masts in the battle to reduce canvas and save the ship, but it was all in vain. With a roar and a hiss, the ship rolled onto her beam ends, and then completely capsized, trapping anybody below decks, and flinging anybody above deck into the ocean. It's a miracle anybody survived at all. In fact, there was no time to lower any of the lifeboats, and those lucky 18 men clambered into one that had simply broken free of its lashings. The ship sat bottom up briefly, with dozens clambering on top of the keel. Captain Burgoyne was thought to be among them, until shortly after, as little as three minutes later, she slipped below the surface, and that was that. Nearly 500 men were dead. And Captain, the Royal Navy's newest warship, was at the bottom of the ocean, along with her inventor. Immediately, all eyes turned to the Admiralty and the ship's builders, Lairds. It was a very uncomfortable situation with a huge amount of public scrutiny and attention. A court of inquiry was immediately convened, and the Admiralty was extremely unimpressed. Chief Constructor, Edward Reed, had been fully aware of Captain's deficiencies since the start. Remember, he had refused to even use the word approved when considering Captain's designs. The findings of the inquiry quickly absolved the Navy and blamed the builders entirely, saying that a miscalculation on the part of Laird through which the ship floated deeper than was intended 
a discrepancy which the controller described as a serious and unexampled error in construction calculations. Now this was exactly the kind of admiralty whitewash you would expect the Navy to produce in the face of an outraged public, but the truth was much more complex. It's true that the Navy had tried to distance itself from the captain's construction, putting full responsibility on Laird's, the builders, and Coles, the designer, to create the ship. But in this, they overstepped. Coles had wanted admiralty supervision for the ship's construction, but the admiralty was so keen to wash their hands of the damn thing that they refused. They did appoint a kind of overseer to make sure the material was quality and up to scratch, but not the material's weight. In the end, Laird's used quality material that was simply too heavy for the ship's design. Reed never used the words approved in reviewing the designs, instead he marked the drawings not objected to, but many of those drawings introduced factors to the design which added to the vessel's weight. If the Admiralty had just gone above and beyond the basic requirements and cooperated with the builders and coals, if they'd even taken more than this cursory interest in the ship they were going to be accepting delivery of, then maybe the weight issues wouldn't have slipped under the radar. An inclination test, that is a test which measures how far a ship can roll before it's lost, was completed, which showed that Laird's calculations were in fact correct. The ship would be lost if she rolled more than 21 degrees. But the papers weren't marked urgent. The results were delayed, and when they were finally published, they were never given to Admiral Milne. For his part, Reed had resigned his position in office and said, I wish the court to believe that my actual departure from the office at length did not arise from this cause, but it had its weight in all that has happened, and I had the strongest reason for not keeping up a systematic assertion of the dangers incurred in the captain. He was under extreme pressure. In fact, in a final interaction with Captain Burgoyne, Reed had said prophetically, I don't want to say any more against her, but I'm glad that it is your fate, and not mine, to go to sea in her. Cole's supporters and government and the public were shocked, but the man was dead, and he couldn't defend himself. In my opinion, it is true that Captain's design was dangerous, the low freeboard was an issue, and it invited big seas to wash over the deck and swamp her, and Coles needs to take a significant portion of the blame. But if the Admiralty hadn't simply tried to wash their hands of the ship's development, if Coles and Reed's and Packington's professional pride had been swallowed, and if they'd all worked closer together with Laird during the construction, maybe the weight issues could have been caught, and Captain's major problems may have been resolved on the stocks. 472 men may have been saved, and Captain could have gone down in history, not as a disaster, but as a curious footnote, a prototype to compare against the HMS Monarch, and then probably just be relegated to use as a hulk or a reserve training ship. In the end, HMS Monarch proved to be the star. She went on to have a successful career before being broken up for scrap all the way later in 1905. Coles had been right in that the turret ship was the future. Eventually turrets became the norm, and battleships boasted all manner of weird and wonderful turret layouts. They were finally standardised with the HMS Dreadnought in 1906, but that's a story for another day. So, where is Captain now? Well, we know, of course, she sank off Cape Finisterre. In August 2022, an effort to rediscover the ship instead turned up four unidentified wrecks, and it's the fourth that best matches the Captain's general dimensions and layout. She's suspected to lie in some 1700 metres, nearly a mile of water, at the bottom of the ocean in an area that has probably protected her from trawlers and the worst of the ocean's corrosive effects, and it's hoped the captain would be in good condition, and an effort led by maritime historian Dr Howard Fuller from the University of Wolverhampton is trying to raise funds to go back out to the fourth wreck and explore it, hoping to lift the veil and shed light on HMS Captain for the first time in nearly 155 years. But for now, she sits in darkness, undisturbed by humankind, a symbol of the uncertainty of experimentation, the danger of bluster, but more importantly, a warning of what happens when we refuse to cooperate. Thank you.